All right. So, welcome to the September 2014 Angular JS NYC meetup. Tonight is a very special meetup because for the first time we have some extra special guests. Uh, Brad and Misko, raise your hand, give a wave. They're back there. <laughs> Probably the reason most of you are here, uh, at least indirectly, the reason why all of you are here. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to start things off by giving a, a quick talk called Directives, Tips, and Weird Tricks. Directives, Tips, did I phrase that weirdly? <laughs> Okay. Uh, and then Misko and Brad are going to do a Q&A with you all. Uh, we didn't set up any questions in advance, so it's all going to be live questions. And whenever that finishes, we are going to do our lightning talks. Lightning talks are not recorded. They are just five-minute demos of something you've been working on, some GitHub project, some new library or component you've been tinkering with. Uh, and if you give a lightning talk, you will receive an Angular t-shirt, which we have somewhere. There. Okay. All right. So I will now get started. So directive tips and weird tricks. Uh, a little bit about me. I my name is Jeremy. Uh, I am a, a front end engineer on Google Double Click stuff. Uh, the details of which you really don't want to hear. Uh, and I'm also one of the organizers for this meetup that you are all sitting in. Uh, so. Why are these directive tips and tricks I'm about to tell you important? So, one, you're going to want to improve your karma. Build reusable components and share them with the world. When you create things that you can share with other people, you are going to be benefiting the community, and that community in turn is going to benefit you by building other components that you yourself can use. And when you build really good components, you're going to get even more karma. And on top of that, it also makes your own project more maintainable from a more practical sense. All right. So I'm going to talk about three things in particular. Uh, one is exposing a sensible directive API. Second is organizing your directive internals. And three is some neat tricks or weird tricks, depending on your point of view. Uh, what I'm not going to talk about today is any performance issues, which is a big enough topic to warrant its own talk, and any visual design or UX stuff, which I am the least qualified person to talk about. So. First, creating a directive API. And when I talk about a directive API, this encompasses the entire surface area in which a fellow programmer is going to interact with your directive. This includes the markup they're writing in their template to put an instance of it on the page, the events that are emitted or processed by your directive, and the CSS that your directive defines even. So what the first thing you want to do with your Directive API is make as much of it optional with sensible defaults. So you may or may not have seen directives exist before, where in order to get started using it, you have to specify six different attributes on it, all of which need to be in a particular format that is not really documented very well. And it's for the better if we can avoid that. Uh, for all of the attributes that you're exposing, really think about whether or not you can make that attribute optional and what the most uh, sensible default would be for that. What would make the most sense? What's the most expected be <clears throat> behavior? Uh, the, and you also want to, yes, customize appearance and behavior via template attributes. Uh, namespace everything. Uh, the prefixes prevent collisions, and it applies to all identifiers seen by the consuming engineer. So what we have here is a very bad example. Uh, it's very vague what's going on in some of these places. Here we just have a directive that's called menu. It emits an event called open. It has a CSS class called menu. These things are all going to collide with other things if you are building a project that is using components from a lot of different sources, um, especially for the CSS. Who doesn't have a CSS class called menu in their application? Uh, so a much better thing to do is to prefix all of these things with the name of your application or whatever namespace you're using. So as an example, I work on double click, so I used dclick here for everything. And another important note about 
prefixing is don't use ng as your prefix. Only the Angular team gets to do that. Uh, that is what signifies that a directive comes from Angular. Okay, uh, this is uh, not so much about Angular, but general component design, but it is a really great thing to be able to document a CSS API for your components. So let's talk about an example of what I mean by this. So say you have some chip list widget or directive from another team or from GitHub or wherever, um, but your UX mocks or your product manager says that the, the chips in it absolutely have to be BISC. And so you inspect the markup and you look at the DOM structure and you see how, how much specificity is uh, there defining the background color and you end up writing a CSS class that's like this one where it's like chip list then it has a child UL that has the class chip container that has a direct child LI that has the chip class but not just any child, it has to be direct to apply your background color BISC. This is going to end up being really brittle and if that component changes at all, the, this wasn't something that they agreed to, uh, the people creating it, it could break at any time. So then you really just wish you could write a, a class that's just, or a, a style rule that's just the chip list chip and set the background color on that. Well, you can if the people creating the components define a CSS API. So when creating a CSS API, you want to just use CSS classes, no element or ID selectors. The ID selectors can collide with uh, other components also specifying ID selectors or other things throughout the application. And they also, along with element selectors, raise the specificity of your styles to a point where it makes it difficult to override them when you need to. Uh, you also want to avoid nesting classes for the same reason. If you need to define a style on a menu item, just do it on the menu item without necessarily being inside of a menu. And expose a sensible surface area such that it's easy for people to get a handle on the different parts of your component that make sense to style differently. Without going overboard, obviously, you wouldn't want to add a CSS class to every single element inside of your components. So here's an example of what a CSS API documentation might look like for a very, very simple uh, component. Uh, we just have a menu that this class is applied to the root element, uh, another class that's applied to it when it's open, and a third class that's applied to each item. Really, you're just defining what classes you're exposing and when those classes are applied or what elements they're applied to. Pretty straightforward but it can help save a lot of people a lot of time if you're writing a component that's going to be used very widely. All right, so directive internals. Uh, when I talk about your directive internals, I'm talking about these four things. It's directive definition, it's controller, template, and CSS. And when we're combining these things, we want to create something that is as flexible, reusable, and extendable as possible most of the time. Uh, so the first piece of advice for this is to isolate and encapsulate, and by that I mean to use an isolate scope for your directives. Uh, an isolate scope makes it so that a, a directive is not a, a direct inheritance of the, the scope from the rest of the page in which it resides, and this helps you avoid collisions of scope properties and also uh, some unexpected issues where you are writing properties to a child scope that don't get propagated back up to a parent scope. Uh, it's one of the most uh, annoying issues that people encounter with Angular. And <coughs> I, uh, encapsulation, uh, your typical object-oriented design philosophy, directives should know nothing about their surrounding page or controller. They should only be aware of their own state and communicate with the outside world through well-documented mechanisms such as the two-way data binding or uh, emitting events. Uh, so, yes, the obvious reaction here is, but my directives need to, nah, my directives and controllers need to talk to each other. This question comes up a lot. There are three different approaches to, to dealing like, with this. So the first is the most basic one that I'm sure everybody who's used Angular to a certain extent has done, is you're just exposing 
uh, event handlers or bindings on your directive. Uh, this is the standard approach that covers the majority of cases uh, where user interaction to a directive is handled by the pages controller. Uh, an example of this here, you have some widget that defines some action and you give an expression that is executed when that action occurs. Very basic. The second event, which is a little more advanced, is using uh, broadcast and emit on the scope to send and receive events. The, uh, these are going to propagate uh, up and down the scope hierarchy depending on which one you use. Uh, this is very situationally useful. Uh, it is applicable for instances where you have events that could apply to a broad scope of listeners. So if you have a, a number of components that could all respond to the same user interaction event, then this would be a good, uh, a good solution for that. Uh, or you have some generic event that is not tied to a single component. An example of this would be if you had an event that was just something like panel open and you had several directives that could all open a panel, this gives you an easy way of making a, a uniform API that something that needs to respond to panels opening could, could handle. And it's also useful for having the directive respond to page controller actions for, uh, for interactions that are specific to your application. So uh, this, is, this is the most specific case and it's a, it's a little more complicated. The idea is you have your directive, it needs to update something about itself, the component, uh, based on interactions that are happening in the outside world. Uh, but because a general component wouldn't have any idea what kind of world it's living in, it tends to be more specific to your application. So if you're building uh, a directive that you know is only ever going to live inside your application, this would be relevant. And the third and my favorite way of doing uh, directive and page controller interactions is to define a, a model state object to encapsulate some, some state and some commands between the two. So what I mean by this is say you have some page controller. This page controller is going to in, in, instantiate some state object that your directive is going to be bound to. So in this case, this page controller is creating an instance of a, a stepper state. This stepper state is going to be the model for your directive. In this case, it's bound via this attribute called stepper state, where you could also use ngModel or whatever other attribute. And the controller can then manipulate the state model in order to affect the state that that director is binding. In this case, it can call a function called next step or previous step or go to step. And the state that is living inside of that, that state model is what is being bound inside of the directive. Okay. And so now for the fun part of the, the talk, we have some neat tricks. Uh, these are things that kind of fall outside the bounds of normal application development and are things that you will start to get into if you are trying to do some really tricky things. So the first is rendering with polymorphism. Our goal here is to render a set of heterogeneous items known only at runtime. So an example of this in the application I work on is this filtering widget. Uh, so we have some list of ads and we want to filter them on a very wide range of criteria. We don't know what the filters are going to be at, uh, like at design time. We only know what the full range of filters could be. We don't know which are going to be applied. And so each of these, uh, each of these filters is its own little chip inside of this list and clicking on it opens up a little edit form for that chip. We want to be able to just repeat over the applied filters and have one each render out its own specific UI just for that filter. And the way that we accomplish this is we bind to a list of models where each model is responsible for rendering itself. In, this, in our particular case, we just create a whole slew of filter objects 
Uh, so, for example, we have a date range filter and a multi-select filter, and each one simply exposes just a template URL, uh, much like a directive would. And when we want to render these out, we use this special very, very small directive that does nothing except bind to one filter model via this filter property and has a template that is nothing but a single ng include for that filter object's template URL. And when we want to use that, we just simply here on the bottom, we repeat over the list of filters and for each one we render out that filter object and the content of one of those filter templates would be something like this on the top where it's whatever UI you need to manipulate that filter. This is really great because it lets you uh, encapsulate each filter, uh, have its logic live entirely within that model, and the, the filter controls on the outside, like everything outside of each one of these individual chips knows nothing about the contents that are going to go, insi go inside of it. So it's very extensible, very easy to add more filters, and this is applicable not just to this filter idea, but to anything where you're rendering out a list of, of components or widgets or objects that each one can have a slightly different appearance or interaction. All right, next trick is pretty straightforward. Uh, using one directive controller with swappable templates. So you might have some UI components that have many, yeah, many visual flavors but are driven by the same logic. So an example of this is a, a stepper or a wizard, a tab bar, a bar chart. Uh, so this is one that we have in our application. We have this stepper, which is a wizard-like component, and it comes in both a vertical flavor and a horizontal flavor, as well as a mini stepper or a mini horizontal stepper. And so the logic for driving each one of these is pretty much exactly the same. You have some list of steps you want to repeat over them, render out their title, their content, but where you render each of those things is different. Fortunately, it's very easy to create multiple directives that all use the same controller. In this case, we've created this stepper controller and simply just define a different template URL for each one. Uh, this lets you very easily create new layouts without changing any code and it also has the nice side effect of forcing you to keep your controller API generic enough to support any kind of stepper. All right, my last neat trick, I call manual transclusion with ng-include. Uh, this one is for when you want to transclude multiple repeated sections into a directive template. Now that sounds really complicated. What do I mean by that? So normal Angular transclusion can be thought of as a picture frame. You have some directive that's called picture frame and it renders out this lovely silver frame. But you want to put some content in it, so you say anything that's inside of my directive is the picture. So in this case we have a picture of Glorious Leader. <laughs> uh, Angular gives you a very easy mechanism to do this. It's just simply the ng transclude directive. But what if you need to do something a little bit more complicated, something like a photo album, where what you're rendering out isn't just one, one container that has one hole, but instead a layout that can have content inserted into multiple places. The directive is responsible for where that content goes, what you're showing at any one time, and you want to be able to put any number of images in there and have them render in the appropriate spot. Angular doesn't really give you a straightforward way of doing this. But we can come up with a kind of hacky way to do it. Uh, so here's the example of uh, what led me want to come up with this. This is that stepper directive again. I wanted to be able to write a template for the stepper that was simply a, a repeat, an ng repeat over a list of steps. And inside of that, I can put the step number, the step title, as you can see there. And then when I got to the correct point to plunk it in there, put in the step content. Well, how would I do that? Well, I realized the easiest way would be to use an ng-include and have the step itself just know how to be rendered. So how do I actually have a, a step know how it's supposed to be rendered? 
when the stepper itself is, the steps themselves can be anything, they, they're specified with the directive. So the easiest way to do this is to, for your steps, whenever where you're parsing them from, you just add their contents to the template cache your, your, uh, yourself. The template cache is an Angular service where once a, a template is requested, it gets stored into the template cache so it doesn't have to get requested again later. But you can manually get the instance of the template cache and put whatever you want inside of it or take out whatever you want to take out of it. And we take advantage of that here by putting in the content for each step with a uniquely a unique ID that we generate on the fly. And we also have to remember that when our stepper directive is destroyed to remove these things from the template cache. Uh, and this lets us accomplish that simple repeat of step in steps where we just ng include each step based on its template URL. And the summation of all of this is that just because Angular is an awesome framework that does a lot for you, doesn't mean you can forget everything you know about good software design. Uh, the neat tricks don't cover this so much, but uh, that was what I would like you all to take away from this. Uh, when you're writing Angular applications, don't try to think of like, how should I do this? How does like, Angular provide a way for this? Angular doesn't provide a way for this. Always innovate and try to find solutions where you can and follow the principles that you've learned throughout your career. All right, any questions? Uh, we gotta bring your mics over for questions so they can make it on the recording. Hey there, um, so when we're talking about directives communicating with other things, um, one way that directives can communicate with other directives, say, uh, is obviously by having a require around using the controllers of that. Do you think that's a reasonable way for directives to communicate with each other? And if so, is there anything that we should be aware of in writing APIs for those controllers? Oh, absolutely. That's a great way. I was more talking about having directives interact with what is in the rest of the page as opposed to a apparent directive that it knows is going to be there and is required by API design. And when it comes to the API for those controllers, just whatever would normally make sense on an API surface. All the way over there. <laughs> oh, he's coming. He's coming this way. Oh. <laughs> Hello. For the um, state model uh, method of communicating between directive and controller, um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on the uh, sort of communication protocol that's used to communicate between the two. So I understood the instantiation and putting the thing in the scope, uh, but maybe you could provide like a very small reduced example of how the uh, directive could be used to control something within the, uh, or how the controller could be used to control something within the directive. Okay, so in the very simple example that I have, uh, this is something I actually have uh, really uh, in use right now, is this stepper state. And the stepper state really just contains of one, the index of the currently selected step, and two, the list of steps. And the page controller can manipulate the currently selected step by calling next or previous or setting the step directly. And it can also uh, manipulate the list of steps itself if it needs to. Um, if you needed to do more complex things, you could also set up uh, event handlers or notifiers or promises even inside of your state object to do whatever you want. But the idea is that anything that your page needs to do that is going to cause your directive to do something is exposed as part of the API surface on this state model and the directive is either watching it or binding to it or uh, listening for promise resolution or uh, event callbacks or anything like that. <laughs> Is there a case where you would need to use the link function within the directive and at the same time use, use the controller function of the directive API? Um, yes. So 
my my opinion on this is that for the most part, all of the behavior of the directive should live inside of its directive controller, and only the bare minimum necessary in compile and link. Uh, what is necessary to do in the link function is any uh, at that stage in the lifecycle is to do any DOM manipulation of your final output, uh, and the way I normally do this is by actually having a function on the controller to do that setup and simply call that function in the link function. Uh, by using like made and broadcast or just by calling the function because you have access to that yeah. scope from one and the other? Well, just by calling the function because the link function is actually past uh, direct the controller instance. Okay, so the hierarchy is controller and then link ultimately. The controller constructor does get called before the link function, yes. Thank you. Jonathan has a question. Along the same lines as that question, uh, what's the difference between, say, passing the element that was, you know, maybe this uh, needs an example, so it may be hard to follow along, but your post link function, let's say, t uh, has an argument that's element, and you're taking that element and you're passing it to a do setup method of your controller. What's the difference between using that element and using the dollar sign element you inject in your controller's constructor? As far as I know, they're the same thing, but maybe somebody would correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> so I guess that's that's my like why use why. You shouldn't even then need your link. So it's not that you need to get access to something you wouldn't normally have. It's just it's at that point in the life cycle at which you should start doing that. If you start doing it in your controller constructor, things might go wrong because it's too early for it. I see. From the perspective of encapsulation, uh, instead of binding things between controllers and directives directly, would it maybe make more sense to use a service as a third party intermediary for consistent state? Uh, you could, but the thing about services is that they have a lifetime of the entire application. So a lot of times you only want things to be alive for the duration of one route. Mm -hmm. uh, so you'd either have to do something in your service to reset that state every time, or you can just directly instantiate it yourself. Mm -hmm. All right, there's one more question in the back, and then we'll we'll finish up with questions what? for me. Back there. Huh. When writing directives, sometimes I find myself writing directives with many attributes. I know you mentioned a default state, but um, is there is that a good sign? Is that a bad sign? Although there's, I've been trying to find other ways around it, or is it just the way it is? Well, my take on this is that, in general, you should try to make as few mandatory attributes as possible in order to get the minimally viable example working for your component. Uh, and for all of the, for the other attributes, make it so that the default, if you don't specify something, is something that makes sense. It's the most expected. Uh, but still, having those attributes is fine if you want to prov provide a greater API surface area for customization. Okay, thank you. All right. All right, so that that is all the questions I had. Hold on, I have to unlock this. So I have one more neat trick that I didn't have the time to talk about. So I'm just going to show you that it's there in my slides that you can access from the Meetup event page. So have fun with that. And that's all for me. Uh, we're going to take a five minute break and then do our Q&A with Brad and Misco. Thanks, everyone. Um, OK, we're going to start. Uh, we have a couple of very special guests who just came from California. So we have Mishko, he invented Angular. And we have Brad, he's the manager, so he made it happen. He got the budget and he manages the Angular team. So welcome.
I'm a little shocked that we haven't been out here for our meetup yet. There's, what, 200 of you who come every, so every month. This is crazy. You're, you're surprised, too. Okay. Well, I apologize. And we're excited to be here now. I'm excited you all came. And we're just here to really answer questions. We can talk about anything. We may not know the answers, but stump us. Like, we're, we're here for you guys. So with that, I don't know, like, we've, we've both been on this project for five years now. Yeah, so we've been on it since the beginning. Mishko is really the thought leader. I was just uh, a cheerleader, but. <laughs> Very good cheerleader. OK, thanks. Anyway, who would like to start us off? Oh, there's one in front here. What was the motivation to create Angular? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think Brad came to me. He's like, you know, you should really learn JavaScript. I think because I was a big fan of Java. He's like, you should really learn JavaScript. I think it's got features or something. And uh, so I said, OK. And I said, well, what should I do? And I said, the first thing that popped in my mind was like, oh, I know. I'll build a framework. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. But. <laughs> um, I mean, so, so we, we tell a more formal story where <laughs> We were actually on a, a project, an internal tools project at Google, and Mishko had been working on this JavaScript. Yes, it's true. I told Mishko, you should learn some JavaScript. There has, there's a future in it. And <laughs> he had been working on this thing on the side. It, it was sort of an external open source project. And then he decided, well, I think I could do this project better by using Angular on it. And he boasted that he could rewrite the project that we've been working on for six months in a couple weeks. I said, well, sure, go for it. Why not? Like, what can I lose? Uh, <laughs> he failed. It took three weeks. So, <laughs> so that's when we kind of knew it was. It might be something good. All right. Next question. Yeah, over here. Mike. Uh, yeah, two questions. Um, if you could give us a preview of the next big Angular release, which is, I guess, Angular two. Like, what what is the goal uh, with it? Uh, and then the second part, which is uh, a fun one, I guess. Uh, somebody who uses Angular in the enterprise, when do you anticipate dropping support for IE9? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll take the first one. <laughs> um, so, so Angular 2.0 is the point where we're actually going to follow Semver, which will be nice for folks to be able to track what's actually going on. We know of all of the things you guys stub your toes on, and we're enraged at ourselves from ever writing something so horrible as we've done today. And, <laughs> and we, we say that with, uh, with some, some credit that you know, Angular does allow a lot of great things. But we want to fundamentally change the way we do a lot of things. Now, Angular 2 will have all of the things you pretty much know and love. There's dependency injection, and data binding, and directives. But the way we're expressing them is very different. And a couple things that we, a couple things we want to make nicer, like the API for directives, is a little bit organic in the way it grew, and we want to make it much nicer, much easier to understand. The same way across the systems, like we have the, the, across all of the other APIs. Uh, you know, we have things like the per, the service service and crazy things like that. Um, so so we, we want to really clean up the API, but but in particular. We want to enable a couple things. So, so one, a lot of folks actually use Angular for building mobile applications. A and we love this. This is fantastic. fantastic. We've actually not done anything special to help you guys. And we want to help you in a very you know, material way where it's, uh, it's obvious and easy how to make them perform well from startup through all of the phases of an application. It's easy to integrate gestures. Um, like the, we, we just like to think through a lot of the pieces. Uh, and then uh, a, last, a last place that we're focusing a lot of effort, kind of at the other end of the spectrum, al although a lot of the problems are shared, is for very large applications. Um, in pro probably kind of at the enterprise end of the spectrum, how do we, how do we make sense of uh, huge teams of you know, potentially hundreds of developers writing a code base and making these very large apps possible to create? Mishka, do you have other things? You covered it. OK. And then Mishka's going to talk about IE9. <laughs> I know nothing about IE9. <laughs> uh, <hi. laughs> let, 
Yeah, let me let me field that too. Okay, so Angular two is also something that well, we know it's not going to be done this year, and for for a lot of reasons, like you know, we we want it to be about the future of the web, and so we're going to rely on a lot of the things that are of the future, and so for the, for us that really means relying on only evergreen browsers, things that get updated all the time, and so really that's IE ten. And so Angular 2 will be the point where we cut over and say that, that really this is about the future. Oh, yeah, I need a... Yeah, Mishka did it. <laughs> All right, you get... Mike Guy, you get to pick. Who, okay. <laughs> so uh, speaking of the future and, like, evergreen browsers, do you think you guys might switch from promises to ECMA 6 generators at any point in Angular 2? Um, especially like in the node world, you have something like Co, but I, I think that as Tracer catches up, you'll be able to do that browser side. Uh, promises and generators, I, I thought were a little different, no? Um, yes, but you can use generators as basically an asynchronous control flow mechanism where you can yield to async um, operations, and then, so then you're not passing callbacks as, into then. I'm not aware of that. Like that, that's news to me. I, I should really investigate that. Let, let me put the marketing spin. Um, we, we haven't investigated it, but it actually sounds kind of interesting. Maybe you come and chat with us. I'd later. love to talk to you afterwards. Okay. Yes, please. Yes. Cool. That's why you get paid the big bucks. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask uh, if somebody is going to, towards uh, scoping out a new project. What would you say, uh, they're trying to like figure out if they're going to use Backbone or AngularJS or which uh, framework, would you say there is a use case where Angular is not the preferred framework? Is there any kind of project that it wouldn't be? Good question. Uh, yeah. Okay. So here's confession. I don't know. <laughs> uh, honestly, so I have built applications in none of the current competitors to Angular today. Uh, I only know through through reputation that, that there are other ones. Um, and, and I kind of know at the surface API level kind of what they're about, but I can't I can't really give a, uh, a good recommendation. I would go ask folks in the community who have used uh, Angular and other ones that you com you care about. The thing I usually tell folks is it, don't let other people decide for you. Go write something significant in the libraries that you care about, in the frameworks that you're interested in exploring. Decide for yourself. Hi, so um, one thing I always wonder about putting so much stuff on the client side, um, especially, you know, given browsers and everything, I mean, it's the more recent things, seeing such rich environments. I mean, were you very concerned about performance, or performance is a really hard thing to tackle, given all you know? Because, I mean, tell you, that's why I've loved the Angular. It just works really fast, and that's that wasn't, like, not my expectation, just given previous frameworks and libraries you see in the client side. So, again, that's why we always push it in the server and keep the client dumb. But at this point, like, dump it on the client. It could do really cool, amazing stuff. So how did you, did you struggle with that? How did you approach that? Shiko, you want to talk about how you thought about performance? Uh, well, we spend time looking at it, but... Uh, no, specifically between doing it on the server versus client only. Oh, the server versus the client thing. Yes. Uh, so we actually investigated a lot of that stuff, uh, whether we could do server-side rendering. Uh, we actually did some experiments, and we were actually able to render a UI in, in something like 200 milliseconds. This included downloading AngularJS, parsing the data, parsing the index HTML, and, and so on. And so when you reach such numbers as 200 milliseconds, like, is, you know, what, what else can a server-side pre-rendering do? Uh, so we kind of uh, looked at it, realized that to get a server-side pre-rendering, it really would complicate things significantly uh, for something we, we just thought weren't a high enough benefit. So looking forward in the future, uh, we just didn't feel like that, that the future would be a server-side pre-rendered world. And so we just made a choice to just focus on uh, client side rendering, or other client side rendering. Somewhere deeper. There's a guy way in the back there. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, so, related to that question on performance, um, 
So I've noticed, for instance, when I load the Angular docs on my phone um, over my 3G connection, it takes to get to a specific doc about 20 seconds maybe, because it's downloading Angular over 3G, it's then making all the requests, download all the data over 3G, versus when I download the entire Vim manual, which is huge, it takes about two seconds, because it is just a single static page. Now, obviously, documentation is not really the ideal use case for Angular or a client-side app. Um, but I was wondering, again, is there anything you can think of to do to speed up use cases like that, or just don't use Angular for things like that? Uh, for documentation, so our documentation is pretty rich. You know, there's examples built into our docs, uh, and this is the primary reason why uh, it takes so long. Uh, and our, you visit our examples, right? When you go into a particular page, there's actual live app that gets loaded inside of it, so you can interact with it. Uh, so it's, essentially, there's two Angulars, one for the for the uh, the documentation itself, and a second Angular for the application in there. Uh, so that's part of the reason why it's it's slower. Uh, actually, you forgot my slow. My eyes are slow. And, and when we were built, so Mishko and I built that site that you, you look at for the most part. The library that you picked to do the code rendering has a long latency on it. Yeah, yeah, so we should fix this because it makes our site look bad for Angular. But it's actually like if you go look at it in a profiler, I think the thing that's the long bar is the thing that renders our code. Prettifying. The prettifying the code. Yes. So, so how about we could go fix that for you, and then... <laughs> Alright, how about the guy way in the back? Way back there, going super deep. Hi, uh, one of the big concerns when picking Angular for an application is crawlability, and that's one of the big caveats that a lot of people throw out when they want to use Angular, especially for consumer-facing applications. So what is Angular, or for that matter, Google going to do to help make um, single-page applications more crawlable and SEO-friendly? Right. Yes, today, if you want your Angular application to be crawled, you have to create a side channel where you've pre-rendered the content. Is it a little crawlable? Well, we're about to get there. Um, uh, and, and there are many services to do this. Um, the, and we, I've blog posted about this before. but. By the end of the year, Google's crawler will render all JavaScript. And so there'll be nothing to do. And as a matter of fact, on Webmaster Tools, you'll be able to go preview what your Angular website or your website written in Backbone or Ember or any other JavaScript framework will look like. So, so there'll be zero to do. This is what they tell me uh, by the end of the year. Is that good enough? Cool. All right, next question. So um, the code schools in New York are just starting to really get into teaching Angular. And one of the things that we found is that the a lot of the documentation, even the basic documentation, is at a very high level. Uh, from the perspective of people who have actually built Angular, is there a place for the junior Angular developer, or is Angular just too complicated for junior developers to touch? That's a good question. So uh, I don't know. We, we'd, we'd have to find some junior developers and ask them. I think there are junior developers who are being successful. In particular, there's two places I recommend. One is egghead.io, which I think is fantastic. And there's a course that I helped build on codeschool.com. And codeschool, I think, is a very nice spoon-fed path with some entertaining content along the way. So if anybody's really interested at, at a very, inter I just learned JavaScript, what can I do next? I would say maybe look at those two places. Write the song. I did not write the song. <laughs> <laughs> but I, it made me giggle when I heard it. Maybe over here, out of this lady in front. Or ignore me, it's fine. <laughs> um, I think you've done a fantastic job. But some of the issues I keep running into, in particular around the dependency injection, um, not being completely isolated to the module, uh, is there any hopes of fixing that before 2.0? <laughs> you can ask more questions. Marketing or? No, no, just <laughs> tell them the real answer. Uh, the real answer to it is that we need a hierarchical injector to, to fix this, and it's going to be fixed definitely fixed properly in 2.0. Uh, we know this works because we have it prototyped. Well, how about not prototyped? We have it working on Angular Dart world, uh, so it's just a matter of bringing it back to JavaScript world.
So no before tool? No. <laughs> you could use Angular Dart. Uh, <laughs> can we uh, maybe up to the front there and then we'll come around? Hi. Um, I represent the junior developer contingent. <laughs> ah, good. Tell us. Um, so I've used Angular in a few different apps. And one of the problems I've run into is that I somehow, well, to preface this, one of the things I love so much about JavaScript is that I can use the console and see, you know, different errors and log things. Um, so one of the problems I've had is I managed to somehow break Angular so thoroughly that my screen goes blank in the browser and my console is blank. And then I'm not quite sure what to do to get it working again. <laughs> so my question is, uh, is there a fix for that, either on your end or on your end? Did, did you clear the cookies? <laughs> so uh, this, it's a, this is a slightly impossible question to answer, but we, we have a project in the labs that I'm hoping will be a good thing for everyone. Because in JavaScript in general, it's kind of easy to wedge yourself in weird off-road places. Brian Ford on our team uh, took some interns in the summer, and he built what we think is the next level of sort of self-documentation for the project. Uh, I think he's calling it ng hint. Is that his project? Mishko doesn't know anything tonight. <laughs> uh, the idea is. When we, when we do errors today, we, we have this thing called minor, where we give you a, a code, or if it's in the fully expanded version, we actually tell you something about what went wrong. We've built a framework where we can be much smarter about the dynamic sort of execution behavior of the system and tell you important things about, hey, you're doing this thing that we think is driving off road. Here is what you want to do instead. So our plan. And we think this is probably only going to make it in 2.0, because we want to focus on that instead of investing a lot more in 1.3 so we can get there faster, will be that we, we want actually the framework to guide you as you develop and hopefully tell you interesting things about the way you're structuring the code, the performance. And we've designed it in such a way that we're hoping that all of you can take your use cases and just contribute them as hints for future developers who run into problems. So I don't really have a good answer today other than grab us if you have a laptop with wedge code <laughs> and we can take a look. Or uh, you know, we hope the future could be better. Good, thumbs up, okay, cool. Maybe back to that guy who I skipped over. So uh, with the community uh, has spawned the UI router and um, do you, are you guys looking to incorporate their ideas into 2.0? Uh, so UI router, absolutely yes. So we have worked on a new router for 2.0, and we wanted to make sure that we had considered all the use cases. Because when we wrote the original router, it was, uh, to our imagination, pretty cool. And it was, except it was vastly inadequate for a large number of use cases. <laughs> and so, again, this guy on the team, Brian, uh, did a, a ton of research, looked at UI Router, actually partnered with the guys, the guys who wrote UI Router, looked at other frameworks and their routing, looked at server-side frameworks and how they do routing, and we've been fairly inclusive of all the functionality. And there's there's another guy, Rob, who uh, wrote this Durandal framework, uh, who's been collaborating with us. And, and they together built what we think is pretty good. Um, and this one you won't have to wait for 2.0 because we're backporting it to 1.3. We wrote it originally in ES6 for 2.0, but we realized that we needed it for this new UX framework that we're developing called Material Design. A bunch of cool, yeah. So, so we're going to have it uh, probably within a month or two where you can make use of it in, in 1.3. Cool. All right, maybe hop, scop, hop. I'll skip. I'll skip. Hey guys, thanks for coming tonight. Uh, <clears throat> actually, uh, I'm from one of these coding schools, the New York Code and Design Academy, and we have one of the first Angular courses. Uh, and it's going pretty, been going, hey, what's up? It's been going pretty well with the junior developers, uh, actually. 
Uh, so, you know, thanks for that, and obviously the documentation will just get better and better. Uh, in fact, one of the instructor who designed the course uh, recorded a lot of those videos on Egghead. So Trevor Ewan, he's been really cool. And pull requests are welcome to the docs, by the way. Oh, good to know. Yeah, <laughs> we'll tell our students that, too. Uh, I was wondering, after watching Google I.O. Uh, and kind of seeing what Polymer can do, if there's any collaboration internally within Google between the two teams, if you guys are thinking about, you know, introducing some of those ideas. And Angular at some point, I mean, it seems like a lot of them are kind of far away as far as browser support goes, but... Is that something you're thinking about now or maybe in the future? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yes, the Polymer team, we, we talk to them regularly. And the thing, the thing we want to make sure is that Polymer components work incredibly well inside Angular. And so there are, there are some things that will work today in Angular 1x, and, but they work kind of by accident. Like if, if the things just happen to work, it, they'll, they'll work well. For advanced Polymer components, you will run into problems. And so this is one of the things Mishko is working on is for 2.0 and actually already in Angular Dart, you can use Polymer components, uh, any, any of those designed. As a matter of fact, any web components, the ones designed by the, in, in part of the, um, the Firefox Bricks project, is it? Yeah. I don't know, Mishko, do you want to talk about more about what you're doing there? Uh, sure. So we wanted to make sure. So part of the, uh, the thing what a web component really is, is it gives um, browser new new vocabulary, new new language, kind of like directives, but like kind of built into the browser. And so we wanted to make sure that when we uh, when, when Angular talks to a particular element, it doesn't know if it's a web component or not. And so we have to have a syntax and strategies that work both through a web component as well as through a native component. And basically that's one of the things we want to focus and and enable in 2.0 so that in all use cases this thing works. Uh, and also uh, web component uh, kind of have this thing called a shadow DOM, and shadow DOM is very similar to the transclusion in Angular. And so one of the things we're doing is we want to make sure that we merge the two concepts and we only have one thing, which is the concept of shadow DOM and content reprojection. So soon you won't have to listen to this crazy word, transclusion. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is yes. Yes, yes, very, very strong yes. Uh, hello. Uh, first of all, congratulations on the uh, RC for 1.3. Uh, very exciting to start using that. Woo! Uh, yeah, definitely very exciting. One, one time binding. Very excited for that. Um, I have three questions. Uh, hopefully that's okay. <laughs> no, sorry. Actually, I have four, but I'm not going to say it. Um, so, uh, first question is, uh, curious what the first milestone for Angular 2.0 is. When that you're looking to hit, what that's going to consist of. Uh, should I just... Yeah. <laughs> all right, so Angular 2 is all vaporware. We've written a lot of design docs. <laughs> if you notice, there are actually some demos. Dart is a project. Like Mishko is defensive. Um, so Mishko would say that what we're doing in Angular Dart is sort of a prototype for a lot of the direction that we want to go. And so if you want to get a preview of what the APIs will look like and some of the advancements we're making, like merging this idea of transclusion with the, the shadow DOM, uh, yeah, content yeah, elements, yeah. hierarchical injectors, X. yes, yes, a, a lot of good stuff is already hitting. Um, there, there is a next level of things that we want to do where we're going to stop just putting them into Angular Dart and we're going to merge the two API sets. We have a crazy idea. Should I talk about it? Sure. So we have this crazy idea where we think we could write the whole project in ES6, the next version of JavaScript, and then generate Dart. Now, this won't work for everything. It won't work at, a, at the DOM-specific API level and, and some other places. But we could do all of the core logic in ES6 and then generate ES5 that runs in today's browsers and Dart so that we could really have one project and have the two APIs be in sync, all the same shared tests. There's a lot of dissension in the team, whether this is actually possible or not. But this is our hope. I forget what the original question was. I've talked so oh, much. Oh, I have two more. Oh, OK, go for it. <laughs> oh, I have one follow-up for the annotation. Maybe just one more, and then grab me afterward sure. for number three. OK. Um, so actually following up on the ES6 question about uh, the brouhaha that erupted over the uh, annotations with ES6 plus, I'm um, curious if you're still crossing your fingers that it'll become a part of ES6, although I think that window is closed. Um, so our annotations that we're adding to the language. So yeah, well, not, not you're right. This cannot go into ES6, but we have some intention. We would love it to be. We would love to propose it for ES7. Yes, we see. It seems to make a lot of sense. Like type and 
and uh, field annotations like are useful in many languages, why not in JavaScript? So, I mean, and, and they were proposed in uh, ES Harmony. Uh, so there's there's some good prior art to build on. Was that it? Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> Um, in the Angular future, or the future of Angular, is there going to be uh, a proper namespace system? Like, is this going to be addressed by the hierarchical DI system? Um, like, namely, if I import a module, I have to be uh, aware of whether there are any collisions, there's no dot notations, and I can't, like, specify uh, a directive as public and, like, a service, an internal service as private. Um, and, like, I've had bosses. Uh, who've been very reticent about using Angular for precisely this reason. I'm just wondering if this is going to be Your addressed in the code. Uh, they did, <laughs> okay. and that's why we couldn't override them. Good, good, Let's go ahead. Mine doesn't code anymore. <laughs> uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, all of these things are going to be answered. If you, if you want to go to details, uh, this is going to be done because in Angular, uh, JS, as it is currently, the string is the key. Uh, in Angular 2.0, the key is going to be actually the type itself. Uh, and because of that, uh, if you have two separate types, they could have the same name. It's not a problem. Uh, they're actually not pointing to the same uh, constructor function, and therefore they're two different things. And that's how we know that they're different stuff. So it's going to be all properly namespaced. Sorry, Brad. <clears throat> There's a guy way in the back again. Okay, excellent. Okay. <laughs> so in the uh, documentation where you guys were writing out your ideal project layout, uh, you guys talked about the uh, you know promise of standard standardized project layout, allowing you guys to create tooling. Do you have any idea, you know, is that actually a real thing that you guys are working on? Any preview in terms of what that tooling might be? I'm going to embed this answer on the spot. I know we said that. <laughs> I think we have a little bit lost sight of handling the tooling on that. And maybe that's something we need to pick up again, or maybe that's something that somebody else sharp could pick up. I don't have a good answer. But if you have an idea for what you want to see in tooling, come grab me. I'd love to know. I think community will be the Yeah, Mishko thinks somebody in the community should do it, because he doesn't want to do it. But. Um, I have two um, questions. The first one is um, I managed to learn Angular in about three weeks by taking an open source app, um, uh, Angular app and ripping it to pieces. That's how I could figure out how the pieces fit together and uh, how I could uh, see how to build each of the pieces. And um, as far as uh, I would like to have that, that you, you supply us with a library of open source Angular apps uh, that include the, your most complex concepts so that can, we can rip them apart and see how they work. Because at this point, there's almost nothing. And I'd hate to have to rely on the documentation um, and take my chances there. Uh, the, the second thing is, as far as being a uh, junior Angular uh, developer is concerned, I can't tell the difference between a junior one and a senior one. To me, either you get it or you don't. You do or you die. <laughs> I like black and white worlds when they're painted in front of me, so that I may blur the lines. Uh, you know, I think uh, you, you might be sad if we were the ones who wrote the complex apps. The, there are many other good learning resources that explain the later stages, the later things you run into in apps. And I think there's, there's many good books. Um, I think like the one by uh, Peter Bacon Darwin is very good. They came out kind of early in the Angular life cycle. One that came later, which I think it, by Ari uh, Lerner, is called NG Book. It, it's very thick, and it goes, and I'm seeing some nodding of heads. It goes into a lot of the deep use cases that you run into. Also, I mean, I didn't mention this er earlier, but Pluralsight has some very extensive courses that cover Angular. So if you wanted some sort of more handheld, do exercises type environment, one of those things is what I would recommend, rather than, like, I think the thing you're describing is maybe for some people love to tear apart big apps and see how they, they work. All of these things that I mentioned have kind of painted pictures about, about larger scale applications and how they fit together. There's a guy in the back again. That's another guy in that back.
I know you guys mentioned for enterprise. Um, one thing that I guess we struggled with was HTTP and dollar resource, and we found comfort in REST Angular. I know there was a brief discussion about that on the docs. Um, can you explain a little bit more about, like, do you guys see, um, I guess, incorporating something similar that's more, like, promise-based or, you know, continuing, let the community take it over? You wrote, you wrote uh, the original yes. resource. You want to talk about what you think the future could be? Sure. Uh, yes, I, I did write the original resource, and it was kind of a quick hack just to kind of get something going. I didn't realize it was going to become so popular. <laughs> Uh, I think the Restangular guys have spent a lot more time thinking about this stuff than, uh, than we have. Now, the question really is, do we want to uh, take on all different possible use cases, or do we want to let the community kind of flourish around this? And I'm personally of the opinion, and I like the community. I like what you guys have been doing so far and the amazing different projects that have kind of filled in the voids, and I think this is the right way going forward. Um, so having said that, though, I think we are going to – uh, revisit the whole uh, the data persistence layer and, and see if we can make it more of a pluggable architecture where others can, can come in and play. Did I miss anything? That's all right. Thank you. Hi. Uh, so what are your thoughts about the uh, controller as syntax, and do you recommend uh, refactoring your application to it? Well, I'm partial to it. You wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> I was a big proponent for it. Um, I, you, well, it, it, it's funny you bring this up because there was a whole evolution of how we went through, and the controller ass, is, I believe, is the uh, most canonical way of, of writing uh, controllers in AngularJS. Uh, in AngularDart, we actually got a step further uh, and made it even, even um, kind of more um, intuitive. Uh, it is something that we're going to integrate back into Angular 2.0. Um, but for AngularJS, Angular, uh, the, the controller as is, in my opinion, the, the most uh, clean way of, of separating and, and making the controller public. Maybe one more question, if there is one. I have one. Okay. <laughs> so you came up with these great tools like um, Karma, which is my favorite. Um, do you have anything new and exciting coming on? I, you know, I think like the, the, the newest thing is that uh, ng hints that I talked about earlier, and the idea is that it's not only a hinting system, but it's it's it instruments all of Angular so that the future version of Batarang will be built on top of it. We also are experimenting with uh, not actually not experimenting, but building in support for Chrome's web tracing framework, so you can get very fine details about what's taking time in your application. Did I miss anything? Okay, guys. Thanks so much. We'll be around.